I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for our North Country Live Fall Series, Indigenous Voices. I would like to thank our sponsors this evening, North Franklin Federal Credit Union and our very own North Country Community College Foundation. Uh, before we begin tonight, we have a lot of people joining us tonight. And to ensure that we have good sound quality, I would like to ask everyone to keep their, their um, their mics muted during the presentation. We will be asking various questions, but I'm sure you'll come up with questions yourself that you would like to ask our panelists. So we please ask that you type them into the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, um, our moderator, Bruce Kelly, will be able to answer those questions. And I'd like to now turn it over to our moderator this evening, Mr. Bruce Kelly. Bruce, you're muted. Thanks, everybody. Go. Thanks, Selena. Thanks, Chris. Got it. Yep. Uh, yep. Welcome, everybody, again. My name is Bruce Kelly. I'm with the Student Services Department here at North Country Community College. Um, Chris, I'm going to let folks know that even during the presentation, they can put some questions in the chat, and maybe you can kind of help monitor those for me. I'll keep my eye on those. Uh, I do have a few questions to get started so that I'm sure once we get rolling, the time will fly by quickly. So a couple of quick introductions. We have four, we're lucky to have four panelists with us tonight. <clears throat> so first of all, we've got, uh, I've got notes all over the place here, so bear with me. <laughs> we've got Jalesa Barrero, who's the executive director of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe. Uh, Jalesa has a BS in communications from Cornell University, um, has an executive education at Dartmouth College and Harvard University. Also a 1995 graduate of Salmon River, hey, hey. We have Benjamin Hearn with us. Benjamin is the sub, uh, a sub chief of the St. Regis Mohawk tribe and he sits on the tribal council. Uh, ben attended North Country Community College and went on to get his BS from SUNY Potsdam. Um, ben is chairperson of the Dewatahuni Corporation, Akwazasne TV, Mohawk Indian Housing Corporation, and Akwazasne Housing Authority. He's on all those boards aside from being a sub chief. Another uh, graduate of Salmon River. Uh, next, we have James Lazor. James is the Director of Economic Development for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe. Uh, James brings 10 plus years of experience in the business arena. Most recently as General Manager of the Mysticini Cree Nations Development Corporation uh, up in Canada. Uh, James, welcome. And lastly, we have Michael Cook. Mike is the Director of the St. Regis Mohawk Health Services. Uh, Mike's uh, got 15 plus years as health director for the St. Regis Mohawk uh, tribe. Uh, he spent four years uh, with Indian Health Services. He was a grant officer for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and is also a Salmon River graduate. How about that, fellas? That's great. Uh, just full disclosure, uh, Jalesa and I play basketball together. Benny and I are cousins. And Mike Cook and I have been friends for 40 plus years. Full disclosure. Okay, let's get started. So I'm gonna start with Ben. Um, ben and then Jalesa maybe answer the same question. When you think back to that, those first few days, Ben, when the pandemic was becoming real and this was really uh, something that was gonna affect folks. What, can, you, can you remember and tell us a little bit about what those first few days were like? Mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it was kind of a series of events that you could just tell that something was brewing. Uh, first and foremost, my background is at the casino. I've spent 19 years at the casino in multiple um, arenas, most recently in marketing. And if you've ever been to the casino, we're 24 uh, seven. Rarely, if any, we've never shut down for any, any specific reason. You know, snow, sleet, hail, tornado, warning, whatever it may be. Um, so on March 17th, when council decided that because of COVID-19, that we had to shut the doors and now we're not talking just, you know, some slot machines, but we're talking about food venues, the hotel, all gaming operations, you know, putting a hiatus to 600 plus jobs. I think that's for me when it really hit home to, wow, this pandemic is here and it was a real eye opener. Um, and then a lot of sleepless nights thereafter uh, because with the casino closure came a lot of uh, different scenarios after it. So I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's when it became real for me, that March 17th date. 
Alessa, maybe a follow-up kind of uh, your memories of that and and maybe expanding a little bit on, as Ben mentioned, maybe the, the financial hardship on, on Akwazasne. Sure. Well, good evening, everybody. And it's nice to be here with everyone. And thank you, uh, Bruce, for the invitation. Um, March 15th is the day I remembered. It was a Sunday. And we all came into the office, my team in the executive director's office, our emergency manager, emergency management director, uh, Derek Cummins, uh, our, my counterpart from the Mohawk Council of Akwazasne, the government on the Canadian side of the reservation, uh, as well as their emergency operations uh, manager, Scott Peters. We were in the office on that Sunday, the 15th, for six to seven hours talking about, you know, what are we going to do? We knew the casino closure was coming. We knew uh, we had to talk about travel, staff who were already on the road, um, different changes that were imminent. And it was even the week before that it really changed. Um, my 15 year old son is in school down in Virginia at a boarding school and we had to bring him home um, a couple days before that, uh, right as their lacrosse season started. So a lot of big changes uh, worldwide, right? So it really felt real working for six or seven hours on a Sunday and just trying to make sense of it all. Um, as, as Benny reference the casino was closed and that's uh, to your question about the financial impact that's had a huge impact for our community uh, we had we receive a monthly distribution from the casino uh, to the tribal government to help fund programs and services and so we had not received the march payment yet we only had january and february and it turns out february was the last transfer we received from the casino so 10 out of 12 months uh, so five, six of that budget we expect has not come in this year. And so we, there's the financial impact, but then that turns into the human impact. So when we looked at what we needed to do, eventually it turned into uh, considerations about social distancing, uh, workplace density reductions, how to safely continue operations through much anxiety, much, um, many unknowns and so in the broad scope, not necessarily that first week in March, the week of March 16th, but as everything unraveled in the following uh, month and a half, we ended up, look, uh, when the casino closed, there were over 700 layoffs that took place uh, for staff. 60% uh, of the staff at the casino are North Country residents, non-tribal member residents, Roughly 40 to 45% of the staff there are tribal members. So, you know, when you have seven, 800 layoffs like that, it's a huge impact, not only to our community, but also to the region. On top of that, at the tribal government side, we had over 300 layoffs that took place. So between, um, you know, both of them, we had over a thousand layoffs in the community, just in the tribal government and within our enterprise, our, our primary enterprise. Um, our private sector, you know, we have over 300 businesses in the community. Uh, there were layoffs that took place there as, as business slowed down as well. So it's, it's had a huge impact for us. We've slowly brought back uh, staff. Some of our staff are paid through our own tribal funds uh, that we collect from our casino revenues, also collections on tobacco, alcohol, and petroleum sales in the territory. The, many of those sales and, and revenue collections have slowed down because fewer people are driving, gassing up. When everyone was staying at home. Um, tobacco has been fairly consistent, although just down slightly, um, and alcohol has been um, down slightly as well, uh, those, those revenues. So big impact layoffs, I guess, is what I would point to first, Bruce. Um, and then, of course, all the uncertainty that came with that. And we still have at the tribal government about 80 staff who have not yet been returned to work. Uh, when we look at returning folks to work, we look at three main criteria. One is operational need. Uh, number two is funding. Do we have the funding for um, the position? And number three is workplace density considerations. Do we have the space that will allow um, uh, that to happen? We've had a lot of changes in our policies with regard to telecommuting, as many government offices and businesses have had to make more accommodations for staff uh, for safety. And so that, that's part of that planning uh, telecommute, making sure we have the equipment 
that's necessary to to affect that change. Um, so those are a couple of things that come to mind, and um, we can probably come back to that. Yeah. Thanks, Jalissa. We'll we'll definitely be back. Um, I'll move to Mike next uh, with the health services, Mike. And there's just so many <laughs> so many places we could go with this and questions to ask. I guess um, a couple of the questions that have been asked. Uh, maybe Mike, the first sort of general question is. Um, what does access to health services at the St. Regis Mohawk Health Services look like now and, and as opposed to prior to the pandemic? Well, um, again, well, thank you for the invite, Bruce. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here this evening with you guys. Um, you know, that to, to kind of piggyback what, you, what you're asking uh, the other two is, is that we, we actually got into the, the um, uh, I guess, no, or kind of no with, with COVID because we, it, it really started hitting. I, I want to go back to November and, and where, where, where we were in the midst of flu season and, and then we were hearing the symptoms that were kind of isolated at times. So we, we've been really uh, impacted by this since, since November or so. But on um, the access, before I get into that, I just want to explain to viewers, uh, listeners as to who, who we are. You know, the health services in, in Aquazesta is, is a comprehensive health program. We have medical, dental, um, we have medical home services, and we have a behavior health program. We have uh, approximately 140 uh, full-time staff. Um, just to give you an idea of our, of our services, in 2019, we had 61,000 outpatient visits. Um, to date in 2020, we're at 32,000. So the numbers definitely have gone down. Um, access, access to the program is, um, and, and around March is when, when has been mentioned, and, and we, we were into full gear of the pretty much an immediate lockdown. We, we never really cut our services um, we reduced them somewhat, but the access turned to uh, uh, audio calling up. Um, we, uh, from, a, from a billing standpoint, the state really gave waivers as to an audio phone visit is the same as an in-person visit. So um, that was good from a, from a revenue billing standpoint. But access for, for our customers is, is that we, we reduce the access to, to the health facility we we also reduce staff to to um uh address the density issues um when folks folks were were um screened before they could enter the facility they had to have an appointment they had to have be screened by a provider and then that was done by phone they would call up for an appointment be screened by the provider and and in most cases were were able to be diagnosed and and um issued uh, scripts meds as, as, as appropriate. So we, and we have a, do have a pharmacy on staff and again, to reduce the density, reduce the, the folks entering into the facility, we, we uh, offered uh, and, and continue to offer curbside service where you pull up, call a number and the meds are, are running out, run out to you. Um, as if things ever get back to normal, I think that's going to be the hardest thing to change because the community really likes that curbside service. So, um, you know, the, the, and that, that's really it with, with access. So, I mean, I've got other details, but I can get into those later. Sure. Thanks, Mike. We, we'll definitely get back. Uh, I want to jump over to James. James, you work specifically with economic development. Uh, at Akwazasne, and, and also I know tourism is a big um, factor in, in your position. Tell us about how those areas have been affected. Well, yeah, definitely there is a lot of economic impact. And thank you again, Bruce, for the invite. Uh, unfortunately, I have to report that I did not go to Sam River for my high school. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we did beat them in lacrosse a few times. <laughs> um, not to make light of it, but definitely the economic impacts where we were focused and our targeted COVID response was to the business community. And yes, we definitely saw the impacts, uh, partial closures, COVID closures. So through economic development, we were fortunate to deliver a small business relief program. 
And in that, we were able to provide one-time grants as relief to these businesses. So immediate impacts from a business, can you imagine one day, um, around the time of March uh, 16th, 17th, that things were going as normal. Um, the tribal council through its jurisdictional control has the powers about the stay at home order as well as tribal council resolutions for um, immediate emergency uh, power. The closures to some businesses definitely uh, happened overnight and had an, a longer lasting impact. So our intention with a relief program was to provide some support in, you know, to help coach, help, you know, some of these businesses stand back up. And, and it wasn't a complete windfall to where they were uh, something that any, any business could start up. It was definitely getting them support as, as quickly as possible. So um, from that perspective, not all businesses could turn, return back to their norm and definitely eager to do so, uh, the, the volume was just wasn't there. Um, what we had as an indication from our relief, we had asked for feedback and we had numerous discussions with local businesses. We got uh, approximately 260 uh, applications for this relief. So all of them it really came out quickly in the type of help they needed. Um, through numerous discussions, we, we also got the types of innovative approaches they were looking at, what they needed to, to sustain themselves. Uh, you can imagine a, a convenience store traditionally doesn't have a drive through and right there on 37, uh, you'll, you'll see some that have a drive up and, and order what you need from the store without making any contact you know, from going in the store. So these are all just a, a tiny measure of what they needed to do so that they had a process of reinvesting in their business at a time when business volume dropped significantly. So you can understand that uh, their, their, their drive and their willingness, um, we had to somehow give a response to it. So from our office and economic development, we were very um, sensitive to the, to the uh, needs of those businesses. And we were doing everything we could to make sure that we could get response. Um, as, as Jalessa had mentioned prior to some of the uh, staff returning and, and some of those staff were in my department as well that returned as we were rolling out a relief package. And, and I think that demonstrates that uh, support that is, that is required for them and definitely helping ensure that we have our support staff in, in place to give those businesses such as tourism. And, and, and you mentioned that as well, Bruce, that tourism, as we were looking to build and establish as a revitalized industry for Aquasasna artists, uh, we were having to look at a, a more personable approach, a very much one-on-one, -on -one, and now you have to pivot in this definite, um, definitive environment that we're in. So it basically, all of those impacts just keep adding up. We've got data that comes back. Some of those COVID closures of businesses, immediately the 65% of them had to shut down out of the businesses that we pulled and 35% were allowed to remain open through, through you know, consistent efforts, uh, not only keeping their staff safe, uh, keeping the public safe. So they had to invest in different uh, plexiglass installations in their storefronts, as you can imagine. So this is, this is that part of where our response to economic development to get a COVID response to local business was really impactful as well. And, and I just want to highlight another point. Imagine we'll get to more points in the uh, economic aspect, but in, in getting these businesses this support at a time where the curfews uh, impacted their business hours, um, stay at home orders, limited traffic. I think this is something that we, we really came together as a community uh, Jalessa, Michael, Benny, we're all community members, so we definitely made it made sure it was an urgency to get response back to the, the people that uh, live day to day, and, and business owners were a big piece of that for us in our department. You know? Thank you, James. Yeah, we'll definitely come back to um, uh, Ben, and, and, and again, Ben and Jalessa work closely together, so I, I sort of address the question to both of you. One of the questions someone has written in is, what steps has the tribal administration taken to try and assist the community during the pandemic? What are some of the things the administration has tried to do? You know, when I when I first came on here, I, I jokingly said that I'm going to divert a lot of questions to Jalasa, but this is the prime example because, um, you know, what they've done for the community um, during COVID has been nothing short of a miracle. 
um, taking into need um, or taking in consideration the needs of the community members from every age category, uh, from newborn all the way up to elders. Um, they they definitely kept things prioritized, and I give them a lot of credit. So Jalasa, you know, take this one away, man. Sure, sure. Thanks, Benny. And you know, I, I guess I'll start by saying um, that week of March 16th, the Tribal Council enacted uh, a state of emergency declaration, and that was really the the first step that got the ball rolling with many other steps, including the casino shutdown. Um, you know, in terms of helping the community uh, and what we've done, I'll first point to council in terms of some of the steps they took, the political steps, and we've seen these across the country, right? We, we started with a mask requirement. We instituted uh, council through tribal council resolution, our legislative process, instituted a curfew for the community, as well as, um, as, well as a travel restriction. So in the beginning, it was a 50 mile travel restriction which didn't mean you can't travel. It just means if you were to travel beyond 50 miles from the territory, you would be required to quarantine for two weeks upon your return. Um, but I think we were the only community in probably uh, the United States that had both a travel restriction and a curfew at the same time. Uh, since, since that time in the interim, the, the curfew has uh, been rescinded. Uh, it was changed a few times, but it's now rescinded. <laughs> But those changes uh, were first and foremost for community safety. You saw a lot of the signage and you'll see it today in the territory, no mask, no service. And you know, at the time in Cornwall, Ontario and in all of Ontario, Quebec, there was no mask requirement at that time. So I felt like our community was really in the lead that way. Uh, when you think about the underlying health conditions of our community versus other communities and what we've learned about the virus and the additional dangers that are present for people with underlying health conditions, um, it's even more important for us. Uh, we do have a uh, community health issue and there's a whole long history for the, you know, um, environmental racism and toxic uh, issues with, with the toxic dump at GM and, and many other issues as well as lifestyle and, and, and eating habits and so on and so forth. So that all contributed to that concern. And so the steps that were taken by the council to have the state of emergency declaration, which then created our relationship uh, or changed our relationship with FEMA. So we're working closely with FEMA to get PPE, mask, gloves, other uh, items into the community, both for the health services and for the general population, uh, working with our local businesses to provide guidance, uh, health and safety guidance. A lot of the Financial uh, assistance that um, that Jimmy mentioned was really um, a part of our CARES funding. The legislation that went through uh, the coronavirus uh, really security and relief act uh, CARES uh, did include tribal governments. Uh, there was a lot of lobbying done, uh, especially uh, from the Senate Democrats, to include tribes in that legislation and thankfully we were. So we received funding that way and that has been able to uh, really assist us and help us assist the community. So when we give money to our local businesses to help them purchase plexiglass and to help reimburse their costs to mitigate and respond to COVID impacts, you know, that came from those federal funds. Uh, so very, uh, very happy to do that. Uh, also looked at making sure that we're looking at our workplace policies and helping our community members. 80% of our tribal staff on the government side, uh, we have about 725 staff, 80% of them are community members. So it's when we're helping our staff, we're helping our community at the same time. Um, but the focus is always on our community, whether it's health services, whether it's economic development, helping people help themselves. Um, you know, in many communities, the tribal government is the only um, economic game in town. And Akwazasne were unique in the fact that there is such a vibrant entrepreneurial spirit and um, over, again, over 300 independently operated businesses. And so they needed that help. Um, assistance to the community has been there. We've also had disaster relief uh, for households, for elders specifically. And rather than just giving you know, money to households, 
uh, through our federal funds. We focused it on several areas. So we helped our community households with uh, internet bills to make sure the kids could stay in school and then be connected. Uh, we helped with fuel and other, um, other areas as well, uh, getting air conditioners to people who needed them, uh, for example. But really the guidance, the messaging, um, technical assistance, and just communicating with our community uh, has been really important to help everyone uh, make sense of everything. There's so many different details um, from policy to, again, just getting cash in people's hands who really need it, uh, looking at how we deliver our services and making sure that we're always keeping the health of our community um, you know, first and foremost. So Bruce, I wasn't sure if there's a particular area you wanted me to go or, or a particular question. <laughs> Um, that's good, Jalessa. That that that's really good. I, I like the uh, sort of the general answers, and it and it covers a lot of ground. I I I may come back with a more specific question, but okay. I want to sort of tie into Mike here with something you said. Um, the the ex Mike, there's a number of questions for you too, but uh, I want to remind viewers if you would like to throw a question in the chat, we can try to get it to the gentleman. Um, Mike, I think uh, I'm real curious about how the COVID nineteen has hit Indian country in general, but before we get there, Jalesa talked about all the uh, precautions that were taken and, and our, our community really uh, tightened up more than some other communities. And I think, um, can you respond to, uh, that seems like it was effective. It seems like we were not inundated with cases, but can you, can you speak to that? Maybe numbers or whatever you can share with us. Well, the, the compliance of the, of the community certainly has been very good. You know, the numbers uh, do speak for themselves because there, there, are, there are cases around us and, and we've been very fortunate. And whether that's a variable of, of compliance or, um, but we've, you know, we've, we've done, we've instituted mass testing. Um, we've got contracts with local vendors where, uh, to date, we've done uh, well over 2,500 tests, and we've had um, less than 15 positive cases in our community. And what's interesting about that is, is that we're not aware of any one of those cases that were symptomatic. And so, th so there, as far as we know, there's, there's been no hospitalizations. And um, so, yes, we, we've been very fortunate in that aspect. And Mike, to, maybe you can speak to too is uh, with your colleagues across the country, it appears that Indian country has been hit more hard than many communities. Is that, is that true? It, it is true, unfortunately. Um, you know, we, I, I have fielded calls from other tribal programs across the country, you know, just basic class and what, you know, what, what are you guys doing up there? Um, because of the numbers are so low. I, I'm, there, there are many, many uh, tribal communities that that are, are, are this, this is a major crisis um, and, and they're dealing with it in a more severe way than, than we are. And, and that's unfortunate, uh, uh, but, but yeah, I, I mean, it has not discriminated against uh, Indian country, that's for sure. Uh, Jalesa, you had a question. Um, what do you see let, you know, hoping that this pandemic is going to hopefully leave us within the next year or so. What, what are you hoping on the other side for economic development and tourism? What, do you, what are your plans or have you been so focused on the COVID that you haven't had a chance to really think too far ahead? Well, no, you, you, you definitely have to take a look at all the scenarios um, that's playing out. Um, being a, the background in economics and business, um, they, you have a certain sen sensitivity to those businesses that know what they need to survive and, and, and employment aspects. Um, how many can of their former employees can they call back? And, and this may have been a common thing across uh, the entire North Country was it was difficult to, to lure, and if you call it lure, maybe it's the wrong choice of word, to have your employees back, maybe that are frontline workers or we're receiving a lower wage than the pandemic employment assistance. And, and that, that one piece is, was intended to make sure that we were distanced. However, it was impacting those businesses and rehiring. So 
I think there's definitely that as um, still plays out to workforce development issues and initiatives that come up. Um, right now, I know and some, maybe Jalissa could speak a little bit more to those um, rehires or employees returning back to work that are having uh, issues with childcare. We, we definitely make sure that we're not uh, immune to that, but we're being very flexible in, in, in this period for a lot of our own staff, as well as you can understand those businesses that require their workers to come back. And, and, and I think it's something that's a, a demonstration, it's a symptom strategically, we need to be coming out of this with more resilience planning towards what it takes to, to where we're most vulnerable and what measures do we have to uh, uh, pretty much uh, you know, come out beyond what we were planning to do. In this case, yes, there, this takes a lot of work and I, I can't, uh, I'm gonna give a lot of kudos and support and cheers for our teammates here, Mike and Jalissa and Benny, uh, looking at all uh, facets of a uh, community, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have one aspect that I focus on. And in from there, we are very much um, in, inclined to, to get as much help as we, we uh, feel that if, if we were in their shoes as well. So to be resilient is to make sure that we're strategically looking out from day to day and look out forward to in a year from now, um, we've seen a lot of vulnerabilities and we want to make sure that we have uh, funding and support to put in place for that. However, I, I think it's something to be said that you, you can't have a crystal ball and whoever does definitely is in high demand. And I think what we'd really want to do is um, take each step uh, that we do come across and definitely not lose attention to the response because uh, if it is a year from now, I mean, it, we're a long way away. So I think it's something that we're gonna to continue to look forward to and put in place any of those strategic plans of what, what support can we provide out to our community as well as what other types of diversification you know, projects we can look at. So th there's a variety there and I hope that helps. Great James, thanks. Um, ben, we just had a, a, a listener, a listener, yeah, a viewer write a question. Uh, early on in the virus, Cornwall, Ontario was selected to quarantine scores of individuals who were on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Mm -hmm. Was the tribe consulted prior to that decision and were there precautions that the tribe needed to take to protect the, the community? You know, from, from my recollection, um, I don't know if there was actual consultation regarding that, but Again, Jalasa had mentioned the fact that we do have um, two governments. We have the southern portion and northern portion. And I think the consultation may have uh, trickled over to the northern portion and then came to us. Um, but it was definitely a concern for us because we, we knew so little about COVID at that time. Uh, we just, uh, the hearsay from the community is that they're purposely bringing COVID positive people onto our back door and that's going to expose us. And we already knew that just from preliminary reports that we were very susceptible to COVID. We had underlying conditions and uh, predisposed to conditions as well. Um, so that communication always gets out regardless if you want it to or not. So um, by whatever means, it did come to council's table and there was a, a very vibrant discussion. Um, I, I can't stress this enough for the panel that you selected tonight. Uh, it really is the gold standard of representation here with Jalasa, Mike, and, and, and Jimmy, because what they've done for the community in protection, um, policies to set forth to ensure that we're protected in the future. Um, so when this happens again, because you never know that we're going to be ready for it. Um, but, you know, this COVID pandemic has turned us on our on our heels and our heads for a lot of things and we've we've had to adjust and we've had to you know come out of those ashes and say you know what we're going to persevere and we're going to handle this and those council decisions when we sit at those tables and we discuss you know the closure of the casino and and mask mandates and shutting down businesses I mean those are those discussions that they're not easy but they're almost near impossible but you have to make those decisions based on the overall good of the community and not just a select few. So um, it, it, it never was easy in that regard. Um, but I do give a lot of credit to, you know, council and, uh, you know, everybody helping out because it did start with that cruise ship coming in. 
that's for me um, finding out like, wow, you know, I'm not going to go to Eastside Mario's anytime soon. And, and I'm going to avoid that bridge at all costs. And, and, and when March 17th, I know I'm going to, you know, sound like a broken record. That's when I was like, okay, I'm going to go and collect food storage and I'm going to, you know, hibernate in my house because I do take care of somebody as well. That is very susceptible. So, I mean, just the entire environment changed for us in, in, in COVID is that reality check that says, be grateful for what we have now and, and what, you know, the tribe is doing for you as a community. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Jules, I've got a couple of questions. I'm going back and forth here, but I, I guess I would say uh, maybe we can come back to this after. What do you think the most difficult challenges being experienced are right now by, by the Mohawk people? Well, that's, uh, that's where our common humanity, you know, brings us back to any community. Uh, we are first and foremost, uh, hungwe hungwe, uh, human beings. And we suffer the same like anyone else. It's the mental health toll. We see a lot of stress in our staff members. We see a lot of stress in our community members, uh, the children in school, the parents who have to stay home and uh, are much more involved, uh, probably more than many would like in getting their kids onto a Zoom class every morning. Uh, the ones who lost their jobs and were wondering if they were gonna be rehired, uh, just general stress and anxiety. Uh, I'm not immune from that, and I don't know anybody who is trying to figure all these things out um, together and trying to show grace and compassion to one another through this time has really been important for us. Um, we, I was just talking to one of our directors the other day who had a staff development day, and, and they had staff who had worked through the whole uh, summer, and they were saying, well, we've been overworked. You know, we had done the job of two and three people ourselves and the staff who came back were saying, well, we've been so stressed out because we never knew if we were going to have a job again. And you guys had your job all summer. And so there were the realization that took place was that whether you stayed on working or whether you were laid off and came back at a later time, uh, there's stress, there's stress all around uh, for various reasons. Um, and, and I want to say, as I mentioned Early on, we met with our counterparts at the Mohawk Council of Aquazust and my counterpart, Heather Phillips, Scott Peters, uh, in their emergency operations center. And throughout this entire pandemic, our council uh, and the Mohawk Council have stayed in good contact. In fact, we have a standing meeting at 9 a.m. tomorrow. We'll be on the line with the council um, on the Canadian side and our tribal council talking about common interests. And they've also had a a curfew. They've also had a travel restriction, and we've tried to sync those up as best we can. Uh, they fall under the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. You know, we take guidance from Franklin County, State of New York, Public Health, um, CDC, and so we've tried to work together. But um, you know, the stress that's been there throughout, uh, we had to make the difficult decision to close our uh, tribal park, Generations Park, and specifically our lacrosse box our relatively new lacrosse box in our, in our playground. And just at the time in the summer where people, they're cooped up at home and to be able to get out and get some exercise. And we've been at, it's a, it's a shame. We've had to keep that lacrosse box closed as a, as a fan and player. Uh, it was tough to see those kids. I saw kids literally trying to climb over the boards uh, during the summer to get into the box. And, you know, one time I just kind of went like this. I said, it's six o'clock. I'm not going to go over and tell them. <laughs> and I, I knew those boys, they're all one family, one household. So I left it alone. But, you know, having to close our park, our box and our playground are still closed. Um, and so our walking trail has remained open and that's been a great thing to be used for stress release and reduction. But um, I, I would say the mental toll, Bruce, has really been tough on everybody. And, and again, it's not unique to Akwazasne. Uh, everyone on this call, I'm sure, feels that in some way. Uh, our parents uh, who, are, who are still with us, our elders in the community being shut in, um, the ones who live in nursing homes and having less visitation uh, from their families. Uh, it's just been really tough. By my 10-year-old son, you know, not being able to see his kids, or his, um, his friends as much, you know, that's really been hard on him. Some of his cousins that he loves so dearly and misses so much, she hasn't been able to see them. Uh, so 
when when North Franklin soccer opened back up uh, this fall, it was like uh, so much, so much excitement for the kids just to be able to see each other again uh, on the playing field. And so that anxiety and that stress, I think that's something we're still going through. I, I think we're all going through that uh, so much uncertainty and, and that's the hardest part. I mean, in our youth, we're seeing that with our statistics and uh, our social services director uh, was just telling me last week, you know, we have many more of our children and, and young adults having uh, mental health problems uh, utilizing the services over at the St. Lawrence Psychiatric Center uh, for extreme cases, but more the volume of those issues are just increasing. And, and it's not only for the youth, um, it's also for our working adults, it's for our parents, um, and it's for our grandparents. Every, everyone's on edge. And so just trying to be good to one another, trying to uh, relate in the best way to each other and, and keep what we call skana, you know, that peace and a good mind as we engage with one another is really, really important. People are on eggshells many times. People are close to tears. You don't know what they're dealing with at home, uh, trying to get through, uh, whether it's financial issues, health issues, anxieties. Um, so we've run the gamut and it's really been quite a summer, um, not being able to see our, our kids play their sports, not being able to do the things we wanna do the nice summer weather. I mean, one of the things we looked at was in the springtime, March, April was very cold. As the weather improved during the summer, people got out on the river, on the pontoons, on the sea dews, at the beaches. Um, and that increased our risk as well as people got together. And just like in general society, at some point people, they say, I'm sick of this. I got to go and see my friend. I got to go see my sibling, my parents. And, and unfortunately, th those activities and those connections uh, also come with risk. And that's where we saw some of our flare up over the summer. But since we had that scare uh, back in June, uh, I think we've really tightened up again. And we see that nationally. It tightens up, people feel comfortable, and then mistakes happen, cases go up, and it's like a you know, back and forth flow. So in many ways, we're, we're similar. Uh, how we relate and deal with the issue may have some unique aspects, and, and certainly there are. Our ceremonies, our longhouses have not been able to, our churches, all our, all our places of worship have been affected. Again, no different than anywhere else in the country, um, and a variety of opinions around that. How do we, what's, what's too far? What's safe enough versus um, maybe some people feeling like it is too far? And you know, I've heard throughout the summer, when you think you're doing too much, you know, keep going because when you let up, that's when you have regrets. And so to the best of our abilities, we're trying to just keep going and get through this. We take it seriously in our community history and Darren, who you had on uh, in the last few weeks could tell you, we've had uh, to deal with outbreaks. We've had influenza outbreaks, cholera, typhoid in the early 1900s and the 1800s. And um, there have been in living memory of our elders, you know, uh, really serious um, virus uh, contagions in the community due to our lack of um, having natural defenses against some of those diseases uh, that we hadn't been familiar with before. So we have that memory um, down at the St. Regis Church. There's a, you know, a mass grave uh, near there from uh, influenza outbreak. So we've dealt with this in our history and it's just, it's been a while, it's been a while, but uh, we do remember that and, and we remember the steps that were taken um, to get through those. But we're doing the best we can you know, with what we have. And that's what our ancestors have always done. And that's what we'll continue to do. Thanks, Phil. It's a good points. Um, uh, just a quick personal thing. I, I, uh, my, my dad is an elder of the community. He's just turned 92. And I think the, 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 the biggest disappointment in this whole thing for him is he was a regular at the St. Regis Mohawk Senior Citizens and he was a fixture there and you know I can see it every day in him I mean he doesn't he doesn't get to go and speak the language with his friends and uh, you know it, it, it's 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 visible you can see it you can see the toll it's taken but um, Mike uh, Jalessa spoke about mental health and I know um, one of your what falls under your umbrella is um, uh, the, the mental health uh, area in, in health services. Um, can you share with us or do you have a feel? Have they seen uh, a large increase? Uh, are they seeing 
more than usual? You know, you know what I'm trying to say? The, the numbers have, have certainly increased. Our, our staff uh, is, is very busy. Um, the, the, just as, as Julissa was saying, the, the strains of, of everyday life is, is really getting to everybody, getting, getting to every segment of our population. So, so yes, the, the numbers are going up in, in our behavior health folks and, and thus putting the strain on the staff as well. Thanks, Mike. Um, James, I, I guess I would start with you because I'm going to ask everybody this question at some point is what, at this point, what are you most, um, what are you most proud of about the, the Aquazosti response to COVID-19? What, what part of the response have you, I mean, I'm sure you're proud of all of it, but is there a couple of things that stick out in your mind what you're most proud of? Like you said, I'm, I'm very much proud of the team I get to work for. Uh, hearing the wins in other departments through Jalesa and the other directors is very positive. Um, a, a personal win I was I had for my department was to to reinstate my staff, and and I think that was one piece. It was the service to the community, uh, as well as we're a tight knit group. And and I mean, I think uh, Mike feels the same about his team. Uh, Jalesa feels the same way with his team. There's there's that camaraderie. And, and we were all staring down similar barrels and you have that same anxiety and those uh, concerns about your family um, st sticking to your bubble as well. So um, I'm proud that we got to reinstate the team. Um, globally, the project we were most focused on is a, a big win for our department. I'm proud to say I work with Ed Smoke. I'll give him a shout out here, even though maybe he's not in your show, but he'll definitely hear about it. Um, that we got a, a big support package to businesses in need and we had to utilize all aspects. Uh, in the beginning, it was two-man show and, and we were able to um, really amplify the, 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 the services we do provide. Uh, establishing a program out of, out of uh, what we've uh, previously done was not necessarily direct grants and in this case we were able to and, and we took it as an opportunity to to really show our support and show um, how we can implement correctly this this uh, package uh, like I we got the feedback and I think that was one of the uh, high points as well as I got to share that feedback from each of the businesses that came in um, positive uh, responses some of this really caught them by surprise that we were able to provide that type of support so quickly um, some of them just, uh, you know, felt they, they, they couldn't put it all into words of how thankful they were to this type of relief. And, and they're just like, uh, like you and me, uh, a business owner has so many um, aspects of being pulled around for within their business. And they have camaraderie with their employees and, and they really care to make sure that they're taken care of. So, yeah, uh, that aspect, uh, I mean, it trickles down all the way through. It's great working alongside these gentlemen in the tribal council, and uh, I look forward to to when I have the team in place that I can handle a bit more challenges. And I, I think this has thrown a definitely a significant amount of challenge at us. Thanks. Absolutely, James. Thank you, Ben. I'll I'll kind of ask you the same question. Um, you know, Ben, you you um, you you come from a big family, as as many people do, and and. Um, What's how has your family, your extended family, uh, dealt with this, and what what areas have you been most proud of in the community? I think with COVID, um, the biggest adjustment that we had to have is um, our family gatherings, our our big meals that we typically have on Sunday. Um, I mentioned earlier about you know taking care of somebody that's uh, immunosuppressed uh, and, and very compromised, so. I had to make that ex executive decision for the household um, to, you know, limit visitation um, and us being, you know, that loud intrusive family that is in each other's business. It was hard for everybody. Um, I will say, thank goodness for Mohawk networks and our internet provider, because now we can, you know, FaceTime and we can zoom and we can Skype. So there's, there's alternative avenues to it. Um, but in saying that, you know, it's been adjustment for everybody. And I think, what I'm most proud of is, you know, what the entire team at the tribe and, and the community has done during this 
pandemic. Um, they had buy-in. Mike had mentioned that there was a high level of compliance and um, it wasn't without some debate and reservation and, and, you know, with council going on, you know, Dedo Tallo talk show and, and doing uh, Facebook live videos of, you know, expressing a need to, you know, shelter in place and expressing a need to wear masks and, and wash your hand for 20 second intervals. And the community as a whole really bought into the fact that we need to protect each other. And you may not be um, an exposed way, but you, you could get it, but not have the impact as, you know, your grandmother, your grandfather may. So for even the, I'm proud of the younger generation that said, you know what, I'm going to wear a mask because it's not about me. It's about who I'm around. And, and that's where the entire community kind of rallied behind. And they hit upon the fact that we had what less than well, around 15 positive for the amount of people that were tested. That's fantastic that we're being viewed as a model community for other ones to kind of see what we're doing. That speaks volumes. And um, I give so much credit to everybody on, you know, the front line. Um, we sit back in council sometimes and we have these heavy, heavy discussions. And for the most part, these three gentlemen are involved in those conversations. Um, it's not easy, but it, it's, it's a collection of thoughts. It's a collection of, you know, perception and, and they're invaluable to us for that reason alone, uh, because um, council is a small piece of the overall working puzzle. So I'm, I'm just proud of the way we all came together and, and devised a plan on how to um, mitigate the risk. Thank you, Ben. Well said. Michael, um, we have another question come up on the chat line. With winter coming now, are you worried you could see an uptick in cases as people may congregate more indoors? How will the yearly flu come into play? Uh, the key key to that question is is, is the is flu and cold season, and you know there's 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 a concern, but you know maybe maybe it's accentuated uh, somewhat from previous years, but. But in the public health field, the message is the same we've done every year. Is is um, in flu season, you 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 wash your hands. You know we've added some now wearing a mask and socially distancing. But but you know we're hoping maybe one of the the um, uh, uh, effects of of these precautions that we've instituted is that potentially flu season is going to be an easy one for us. We have, um, we've done some flu pods. Um, I think we've done three flu pods and, and the participation from the community has been tremendous. We're, we're way over what we've done in previous years. So it's in people's minds and, and being extra careful. So yes, there's some concerns. It's no different from any other flu season upon us, but maybe, maybe it'll be better. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mike. Jalessa, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, I, I don't know that I really have a, a question for you, but uh, maybe um, how would you leave um, the meeting tonight? What would you want to say to folks to sort of sort of tie tie the loop together, close, close us out? Sure. Thanks, Bruce. Um, you know, I first I'll say I agree 100% with uh, Benny. Our team's been fantastic. I want to give a shout out to our emergency operations center and Derek Cummins and our compliance department. They've been working with the local businesses on room occupancies and all the, you know, the, the mask mandates and so on and so forth. So the team has been great. You know, you're as strong as your team. And so we have a, we have a very strong team working, but you know, to close it out, I would say we're not out of the woods. Um, if you look at the headlines today, it's a record number of positive cases across the United States today. I think it was about 80, 88,000 cases. So we're not through this yet. And we have to, we have to uh, keep the faith. Uh, we have to support one another. Uh, we have to stay compliant with the practices that are going to keep our community safe. But we can't be lulled into a false sense. You know, I mean, as much as I'm appreciative of everything that we've done, and I want to give... Uh, boys and pats on the back, you know, we still have a lot of way uh, to go yet to get through this winter and until we can get a vaccine going sometime next year and widely distributed. 
So we're not out of the woods. You know, that's that's really my the way I'm thinking about it. Um, we're we've we've done well so far, and, and we need to keep it up. Um, and it's not just ourselves on the territory, right? We have to understand that we're part of a larger community in the region, in the North Country, and all the participants tonight are part of that. So our our communities are interconnected. We rely on one another. And so if we're doing everything we can do in Aquazustin, but you know the folks in Messina or Malone or Cornwall or not, or Plattsburgh uh, or Ogdensburg, it's all going to come together. It's all going to come together. We do have uh, family members that have passed away. Um, I have a cousin in Ogdensburg, um, and her husband passed away from COVID. Um, and so that that was an impact in our Cook family and the community. But you know, it, it's something we have to keep our vigilance uh, strong. And, and keep supporting because the, the longer this goes, the more serious those mental health effects will be. And um, I, that's one of my fears moving forward is how is that gonna manifest itself? What are we gonna see there? Um, it's hard enough as it is now. Um, and so we just, we just have to keep, keep going, you know, just, just keep going through it and, and come out on the other side safe and sound. And, and I look forward to the day that we can have a big block party at Generations Park and, you know, celebrate everyone and get some music and the kids and watch them play their lacrosse and just play some music and feel good as a community and have a big community picnic to get together. And I'm sure every community and family wants to do that, but it's going to happen for us. We're going to get back there. I, I, I know we will. Right now, we're just going through tough times um, in Aquazosti and throughout the North Country and throughout the United States and the world. But it's a record number of cases today, so we have to keep our vigilance up and and keep fighting the good fight. So I guess that's that's where I'll leave it tonight, Bruce. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to uh, apologize if you put a question on the chat line. We weren't able to get to all the questions. I think we had some some good discussion tonight, uh, gentlemen. Yawa go to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, I personally want to express my gratitude for all of you taking the time out of your busy schedules. Obviously, you're all very busy. Um, I think we've learned a great deal tonight. And Selena, I'm gonna throw it back to you in a second. So again, um, I hope everybody enjoyed um, the discussion this evening. Selena. I, I would like to just, just second that. What a wonderful discussion and, and so insightful. Thank you all for sharing with us. I know we're, we're all very grateful. We're also very grateful to our sponsor tonight, our North Franklin Federal Credit Union and our own North Country uh, Community College, Fo College Foundation. So we'd like to thank them and a nice shout out to our enrollment and marketing team. Um, I just would like to let you know that there is a new film series or a new film coming out. And we are going to be co-sponsoring with Paul Smith and the Zonta Club of the Adirondacks and it will be the screening of Without a Whisper. Um, and it will be available for viewing from November 9th through the 15th. So if you would like to sign up for that movie, please see our North Country Live page and, and you can fill out a form there. I also want to let you know that in the spring, we're already planning for what we're going to offer in the spring. Um, in early summer, we're going to be looking at environmental issues and climate change and lots of other things. So again, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again on North Country Live. Thank you everyone and have a great evening.